Hi there. We're going to get started. Hi. Um, my name is Ken Mayer. I work at Fenway Health in Boston and uh, at Beth Israel Ho Deaconess Hospital and Harvard Medical School and have been involved in HIV care since the start of the epidemic and do clinical trials, including uh, some of the uh, recent uh, PrEP studies. So um, before we um, delve into the meat of this, which is uh, the public health implications of PrEP, uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Stephanie, would you like to start? Um, so I'm Stephanie Cohen. I'm an HIV primary care doctor and the medical director of San Francisco City Clinic, which is the only municipal STD clinic in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, and I'm spearheading an effort to implement a demonstration project at our clinic. I am Dana Van Gorder, the executive director of Project Inform, and we are working on issues related to demonstration projects and financing of PrEP. Hi, I'm Umea Abbas. I'm infectious disease clinician and researcher at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. My research focuses on mathematical and computational modeling of HIV AIDS and looking at the impact of antiretrovirals on the spread of HIV and drug resistance. Um, I'm Mitchell Warren. I direct AVAC, an advocacy organization based in New York that focuses on HIV prevention research and the development and distribution of new prevention options. Uh, and uh, delighted to be here. We've been involved in advocacy related to PrEP for a number of years. Hello, I'm Sheena McCormack. Um, I work for the Medical Research Council in the UK, the Clinical Trials Unit, where I'm responsible for the HIV prevention trials. Um, and I guess my main experience there has come from a, a large microbicide trial uh, as part of the microbicide development program, which took place in sub-Saharan Africa. But since 1986, I've also been an HIV GU physician um, in the UK. Uh, so I've also been involved in the HIV epidemic from that time, uh, looking after mainly MSM. Hi, everybody. I'm Gina Morazzo from the University of Washington. I'm an infectious disease physician by training, also with a long interest, long standing interest in sexually transmitted infections and vaginal health as well. Also, have provided HIV primary care since I was a resident. And then, uh, thirdly, I'm the protocol co chair for the VOICE study, which I think most of you are familiar with. It's a large study randomizing women to oral or vaginal pre exposure prophylaxis used daily uh, with tenofovir based regimens. So as you can see in here, we have really an excellent panel who will be able to provide a variety of points of view. Um, I really want to thank the forum for putting this uh, this meeting together. Um, it, to me, this is very um, interesting and very exciting. It's sort of be careful what you wish for, you may get it. For some of us who've been involved in chemoprophylaxis research for, for more than a decade um, plus and seeing some of the, uh, some of the various uh, turns in the road uh, from... Uh, uh, the situation in Cambodia to some of the non-specific microbicide trials to be here today to say how do we actually implement this is is quite quite a quite a place to be but quite a daunting one. So this panel is going to be focusing on several of the public health challenges. Uh, the big questions are what does prep implementation look like? Um, how is the public health impact assessed? And that's really why the discussion of monitoring resistance and surveillance around behavior is going to be an important part of our discussion. Um, then the other two big questions are who pays, and the sub-question of that is how do you allocate rare, um, scarce resources in these um, challenging times? So let, let's start off, and um, Stephanie is, is developing a demonstration project. So Stephanie, would you want to comment upon what are the key elements of the demonstration project uh, that will be providing prep in a, quote, real-world setting? Sure, and first I'll start by giving a little background on where we are with our demonstration project. Um, so we at the STD section of the SF um, Department of Public Health, and I also just want to recognize our section director, Susan Phillip, who's here with me today, um, are partnering with the HIV prevention section um, to administer this demonstration project. And we're funded through um, an NIAID supplement to an R01 called PUMA, which is the prevention umbrella for MSM in the Americas, which is an R a large R01 that's looking at developing kind of a menu of um, prevention interventions to offer the optimal combination HIV prevention package to diverse populations of MSM. Um, so we initially went in to this demonstration project with the plan to offer PrEP at two sites in San Francisco, um, our municipal STD clinic, as well as a um, community-based gay men's health center that's supported through the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. 
Um, but due to challenges in terms of space and capacity at the Gaiman's Community Health Center, we've decided to just um, implement PrEP at our STD clinic, at least for now. We explored offering PrEP at many other sites in San Francisco, and I think a lot of the challenges in finding the best site to deliver PrEP have already been touched on today. But we looked into um, community -based, other community-based health centers. Um, we just spoke with, Pi with Kaiser. We talked to primary care doctors who serve a large population of um, MSM, um, as well as with community-based organizations. And really, at this point in time, an STD clinic kind of has the optimal um, package of services already available and the capacity to do PrEP. And that's not to say that we don't recognize the importance of finding other diverse sites where PrEP can be offered, and I think that's a major goal of ours over the next few years. Um, but just getting PrEP off the ground, um, a municipal STD clinic is a really um, ideal setting to do it, as we have a mix of clinical counseling, nursing, phlebotomy, um, and experience with medication administration. That said, what we don't have is experience with continuity care. Most of what we do is episodic um, as, as specialty STD services, so figuring out how to reorient our clinic around the longitudinal care that PrEP um, requires is going to be a challenge for us. Um, we do have a small Ryan White funded HIV primary care clinic on site, so we do some degree of continuity care, but it's not our bread and butter. And then secondly, I just wanted to mention kind of the four domains of questions that we want to try to address through this demonstration project, and again, many of which have already been touched on today, um, and those are uptake and acceptability. So really understanding among those eligible for PrEP, who initiates, who decides to go forward, and who doesn't, and why. Um, we think that that's a key question that can be looked at through a demonstration project. And again, it's going to be very context specific. We're offering PrEP free at our municipal STD clinic. We're going to um, offer PrEP as part of a combination prevention package that includes regular STD screening and counseling. Um, and so the folks who decide to um, initiate PrEP with us are going to have to want and accept that full package of services. Um, the second domain is safety and effectiveness, and I think that's really been talked about extensively already today, but those that, I think, comprises things like adherence, risk compensation, diversion, resistance, side effects, and tolerability. And, you know, we would like to try to monitor for those through our demonstration project, but a demonstration project is not necessarily going to be able to answer all of those questions. Um, and I think in particular, around the important issue of risk compensation, we recognize that we're not going to have a control group um, and really thinking about the right study design to be able to look at risk compensation in this context is going to be challenging. Um, we know that people, when asked over and over again about their risk behaviors, there's a regression to the mean. So if we don't see that, I think we'll be concerned. But again, this is not going to be um, an easy thing to, to study as much as I think we all know we need to look at it. Um, and then the third domain is cost and feasibility. So that, again, I think is something we will be able to address in terms of can we integrate this service into the operations of a very, very busy, small, stretched municipal STD clinic. We have a robust non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis program that's been in place for many years. So we have experience with PEP. But again, um, the challenge of lab monitoring and longitudinal care will be new for us. Um, and I think we'll be able to look at what staff, space, time, and money are required to do PrEP in our setting. And then the last domain is sort of what I think of broadly as best practices for PrEP. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity with all the demonstration projects that hopefully will be occurring in many different types of sites across the country to look at the questions of what type of counseling, what type of adherence and risk reduction counseling should be part of PrEP, um, what mix of providers is best equipped to offer PrEP, um, whether it's clinicians, counselors, social workers, nurses, et cetera, what, how much monitoring, both not just in terms of HIV testing, but also kidney function monitoring, what type is um, 
is necessary and how do we train providers to identify folks who may benefit from PrEP um, and do the sexual health screening that's necessary um, for that as has come up um, many times already today. So, um, and then I think the, the last challenge that I want to mention in terms of planning this project is really one that stems from how to do implementation science in general, which is that we really want this to be real world. We want to see what PrEP looks like in a real world setting, but we also need to build a research infrastructure and do enough data collection to try to answer this long list of questions that I've just laid out. And so we're struggling with how to keep this streamlined, how to keep our visits brief, how to, um, again, simulate the real world, but still do the data collection that we need. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so, Sheena, would you uh, care to provide a perspective of what's the thinking going on in the UK at this point around PrEP demonstration projects? Yeah, sure. So I think we felt that the most, apart from, you know, the cost effectiveness of it, uh, is, is, is this, the question around risk compensation. So we wanted, we planned to do, uh, a randomized trial, in fact, rather than a demonstration project, where individuals would be randomized to an offer of PrEP now, or an offer of PrEP in 12 months time. Um, and they would know that they were taking, uh, PrEP. And in the first 12 months, you would be able to do a randomized comparison of this net benefit with a biological outcome. Um, and therefore, you could manage the problems associated with reporting um, sexual behavior and adherence to condoms over time. Uh, and individuals would be, would be uh, tested for HIV and STI every three months uh, in the clinic network which I should probably explain, in the UK, we're incredibly fortunate. We have a network of 204 clinics that are part of our national health um, service. Um, and these clinics are where 80% or more of the HIV testing in the UK goes on, as well as all of the HIV care. Um, and so that's where antiretrovirals are already prescribed for treatment. So you have physicians who, who are familiar with the, uh, the issues around uh, the drugs, the side effects, the toxicity, and we report in uh, every year to our equivalent of CDC uh, the STI diagnoses, the HIV diagnoses are ta tagged to this clinic number. So there's there's national surveillance for the uh, the you know the numbers of people who are coming back for retesting. So we know we see 55,000 MSM in this in this clinic network every year for HIV testing, uh, and uh, about 14,000 of those come back already to have a second test in this in this system. And our incidence in that population is 2.7 per you know per hundred uh, men years, but it's it's probably higher than that. I mean, in my own clinic, we diagnosed 28 new infections the week before last, uh, which is our highest number so far. And that's a clinic that's seeing about 5,000 men every every year for testing. So we're already doing quarterly HIV and STI testing anyway in this population. And an awful lot of what your challenges are uh, for monitoring um, safety are already in place in clinical care. So we're very fortunate in that regard. And we felt that globally, in this rather unique clinic system, it was one of the few places where we could actually address this question with a biological outcome of risk compensation. Does it offset the benefits of, of PrEP in terms of it preventing uh, HIV? So that, that's an approach. Great. Thanks, Sheena. Uh, other panelists would like to comment? Dana, you, you've been thinking a lot about demonstration projects. Any additional insights? Uh, AVAC, and I, I would mention that this week um, at, at the Atlanta conference, there was a group of agencies that uh, sort of issued a call for demonstration projects in the United States, as well as a pretty thorough description of what we think those projects really need to accomplish. I think it's, uh, and those would be available on the yeah, websites of, uh, yes, at, at AVAC or Project Inform or uh, AMFAR or the San Francisco AIDS Foundation who are also here and participated in that process. Um, I mean, obviously to the credit of the NIH and the CDC, a great deal of thought is being put into uh, uh, the question of how to proceed with demonstration projects in what populations um, and in what manner. 
uh, the NIH uh, has certainly made a, at least an initial commitment to, it looks like, you know, two projects and potentially more. The CDC, I think, is working to identify funds. Um, the California HIV Research Program in California has made a commitment to uh, conducting demonstration projects that actually link PrEP and TLC Plus together, which I think is really very important and a fairly substantial commitment. But I think uh, it's the sense of our group that for the time being, um, and sort of pending additional data about other populations, it would be really critical to move forward with a robust set of demonstration projects that address MSM and transgender uh, females, and have really sort of called on, you know, early on, Ron Valdesari and HHS indicated that they would be playing the role of really trying to sort of coordinate the federal agencies to develop as robust a program uh, as possible, but conceivably sort of other entities um, as well who might be involved in projects. Gilead has, uh, fortunately, in addition to uh, indicating their willingness to provide drug to demonstration projects, potentially actually funding projects themselves uh, directly. Um, but I think it goes without saying that uh, we have been uh, trying to answer, uh, uh, we've identified a, a very significant set of potential problems with PrEP, and now it's time to sort of figure out by what means we can actually deliver this um, to help it achieve what I think is a relatively significant, um, significant promise. I think it's obviously extremely important that the research that moves forward, whether it's at NIH, CDC, NIMH, and a variety of other entities, is is really carefully planned and well coordinated, so that we make sure that we uh, get the answers that we need to, to have in a comprehensive way um, as uh, quickly as possible, um, and in uh, and in a thoughtful way, and uh, hopefully additional steps will be taken to make sure that that, that happens. And, uh, you know, and with regard to the question of really sort of figuring out what the potential is for PrEP, I think it's really critical that uh, without, you know, placing a bias onto the demonstration projects, they are really, you know, uh, intended to help us to decide what the ideal populations are that might benefit from PrEP, what the best uh, methods of, of conducting outreach and recruiting the participants, what the best methods of supporting adherence um, and reducing risk compensation, um, sort of the optimal settings, you know, clinical and otherwise, in which this can be most effectively uh, delivered, uh, by what uh, methods we make sure that uh, PrEP is carefully integrated with testing and linkage to care so that we aren't pursuing uh, PrEP uh, on its own uh, without regard to sort of the other elements of the national HIV AIDS strategy that uh, are so important. Thanks, Dana. Other, other comments uh, from members of the panel around this issue of demonstration projects? Mitchell? Yeah. Again, perhaps just to state the obvious, and I think we, we probably all know it, but just to be explicit, we, we often, I, I think over the years, have focused so much on the pill, uh, whether it's tenofovir alone or combined with emtricitabine. And I think um, we all know that PrEP is not a pill. It needs to be, and I think it goes back to many of the comments you've heard earlier, but just to frame it slightly differently, this is a, a program. So when we think about the demonstration projects, I want to be sure we're not thinking only of how does one deliver this pill. Uh, in terms of the logistics of the tablet. It's about how do we deliver all that goes into a comprehensive program. And, and, and I realize that's been putting an even higher bar when I think back to some of Mike's comments on, on the last panel, um, that, that you know, if it were just a pill, it would be hard enough. If it's a pill plus testing plus monitoring plus the education, um, and I certainly don't want to put more bars on, uh, the, raise the bar for success. I actually think when we frame it, and understand it, we, we can actually look at, at existing infrastructure, which is already overburdened in some ways, but also uh, in other ways I think can be repurposed and, and refreshed, so to speak, when we talk about the addition uh, of an option like pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I, I think we need to be sure that, that demonstration projects aren't about pill delivery. They're about programs that help people understand risk and, and present one additional option on top of what we already have. Um, in the way in which we, we think about uh, the future of, of prevention. Yeah, important point. Jeannie? Yeah, at the risk of being repetitive, a lot of this has been said this morning, but I do want to build on one thing that Mitchell said, and I, I really think that we should think about these projects in the context of 
places and programs and providers that can offer sustained delivery of sexual health services. And as Connie pointed out this morning, if we're really going for high incidence group, we're already dealing with people who are not using condoms 90% of the time. And thinking about initiating sexual health, of which PrEP is only one piece, and then continuing to work with them to help move them on a continuum, perhaps, to staying negative and staying sexually healthy. I think a couple of points there is that we have to think about ensuring the skill of the individual providers. That's come up a couple times. But I do want to remind people that, you know, we've been trying to get this prevention with positives effort off the ground for a long time to get HIV care providers to ask, screen, intervene, ask about anatomic sites exposed during unprotected sex, test those sites, including the rectum and the pharynx for gonorrhea and chlamydia, don't just do a syphilis test in the urine, and then intervene with risk reduction counseling that's very targeted to what you're doing. Have we been successful in doing that? I don't think so quite yet. It's really challenging. A lot of providers, and I completely understand it, being in a busy HIV care setting, do have that attitude of don't ask, don't tell, don't look, don't find, get out on time. Uh, because if you do start to ask and it, you know, and you don't have a kit to screen at the rectum and the pharynx, it's a huge barrier to, to really getting that done. So I think we have to think about that in the context of PrEP because if we are going to have settings where PrEP is going to be continually given and we really will need to continue to ask people about ongoing risk exposure, if we detect people who have incident, incident STDs while they're on PrEP, but they don't get HIV, they're not off the hook. That means we have to sort of have an intervention that focuses on what happened there, do they understand what that's about in the context of them being on the pill for PrEP, and how can we really enhance providers' skills uh, to do that. The last thing I'll say is that I think that there is, I, I agree that we're all overburdened, I agree that we're all busy, I agree that certainly in the HIV care setting that's true, but I also think that providers don't appreciate that you can do very brief risk assessments and risk reductions and that those matter. I think that maybe it was Dr. Sweeney who brought that up this morning, but coming from a trusted provider, it can mean a lot to just be asked about what your sex, sex life is like. What, so what's been going on with you sexually since the last time I saw you? It takes two seconds to ask that question, and it may take 20 seconds to get an answer that can be incredibly valuable. So I think we should not let providers off the hook either, just like Dr. Sweeney didn't let her husband off the hook about the bed making. I think you can train them to be more effective, more focused, and more efficient to do these things, and we should, we should really be able to to do that. The last comment I'll make about STD clinics is, um, you know, STD clinics are going away. Um, we now have one STD clinic left in the state of Washington. We used to have several. Ours is the only one we have is the Seattle STD clinic. Fun Massachusetts has no STD clinics, right? That was cut. So I love the idea of using STD clinics to identify high-risk populations, but there are a couple of problems with that. One is the fact that resources are resulting in the loss of those services, which is really quite tragic when we're facing increases in syphilis, increases in antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea, et cetera. The other problem is that a lot of our vulnerable populations see those clinics as very stigmatizing. I can tell you in our STD clinic, we don't see a lot of adolescents, and most of the patients that we see are men. It's not a place that many women see as a kind of welcoming, nurturing, um, sort of place, safe place to go. I think it's a good clinic, but I think the perceptions in the community are going to be very important when we think about where we're going to run, wanna, where we're going to want to rule these out. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, so you, you, you've all really spoken quite eloquently about some of the core elements of the demonstration projects. Just would like to probe a little further, because um, uh, many of the reasons why people may be at risk for HIV relate to um, broader issues than what we normally will think of in the context of sexual health. So um, substance use um, uh, can be a um, major, major uh, driver of, of risk. Relationship dynamics, particularly if we're trying to make um, uh, uh, these medications available to uh, particularly vulnerable populations, uh, uh, women at, at risk for HIV. And then there's the whole issue of many communities in the United States of medical mistrust. And here's this biomedical intervention, um, you know, and without um, in embracing or dealing with some of the other um, issues that are uh, active in their lives. So I'm just curious if maybe you've given any thought about um, is that the next generation of demonstration project or how some of the um, some of the projects we're talking about, some of the principles uh, incorporate some of these uh, um, important contextual issues. Mitchell? Actually, just to go back to the, the theme of it's not just the pill, uh, as, as we think about it, there, there are a number of entry points for people in different situations that may not actually be the ones where a pill would be delivered. So when I think about some of the substance issues or some of the audiences we may think of as targeted 
or potential PrEP use, they may be getting a lot of their information about their sexual health, about their risk, about their ability to stay uh, healthy from places that can't provide a pill. And that's okay. So as we think about who might deliver the actual tablet, we also have to think about who's going to deliver the broader information about risk and about PrEP. And I think we need to really be thinking in demonstration projects and outside of them, what are the roles of community-based organizations, of providers of other services who may not provide the pill, but may be providing the information to help someone think, oh, maybe I'm at a different kind of risk than I thought, and maybe I might want to consider a pill, and then being able to refer to the actual place where one gets the tablet. So I think we need to, to be very creative and understand where people are. And it kind of goes back to the actual, absolute most commonsensical marketing um, uh, uh, principle, which is know your audience. And if we know who they are, if we know where they are, and if we know who they trust, it may not be the health provider for the information. So perhaps the information comes through a community-based organization, but the prescription comes through the medical provider, who they may not always trust, but the information might be coming from multiple directions. So I, I think we need to be very clear not to, to, to box ourselves into a model um, in any one place and for any one audience, because I think by definition, we're going to be looking at multiple potential users and multiple routes of delivery of multiple different things, information and medication. Stephanie? I think, um, Ken, you raise a really important and excellent point, and um, we've thought a lot about that for our San Francisco demonstration project because we know that our municipal STD clinic doesn't serve everyone who is at high risk for um, HIV in San Francisco. And so we're partnering, partnering with San Francisco AIDS Foundation to really help us with recruitment and referral from the community, from community-based organizations, as well as um, the Gay Men's Health Center in the Castro. Um, San Francisco AIDS Foundation supports um, a Latino and African-American men's support in community groups, and so we hope to be able to reach out to them as well, such that people will come into our demonstration project kind of through two routes, both um, patients who come into the clinic seeking sexual health services who may never have heard of PrEP and are identified as eligible, but also people who may have been referred in from one of our um, partners in the community. You know, I think ideally we'd like those partners in the community to be able to administer PrEP themselves because that's one less barrier to getting the person in the door. But at least in this phase one of the project, while we build capacity and try to figure out how to do it ourselves, um, we will be bringing them into our clinic. Um, and I think that that's another important role that municipal STD clinics, at least those that are left standing, <laughs> can play, which is as a center of excellence who can then build capacity um, in the community to, to offer and um, monitor PrEP. If and I the other thing, sorry, I just wanted to mention, which I forgot to mention earlier, is um, although we don't have a second site in San Francisco, we have recently developed a partnership with the Miami STD Clinic, um, who is going to be a second site in our demonstration project, which I think is going to bring some very important racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity to this demonstration project. So, Stephanie, if I can just push a little further, how well equipped do you think the project will be to address the hierarchy of needs of people that might um, enhance their adherence? You know, things like uh, unstable housing or uh, uh, lack of uh, jobs, economic uncertainty. Will there be a social service component uh, built into it? Well, um, we have counselors and healthcare workers who are very experienced with risk reduction counseling and motivational interviewing, and we have that built into our PEP program and also have um, a rectal infection prevention program for HIV negative MSM who are diagnosed with rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia. So I think from that standpoint, we have the services in place, but the broader array of um, social support services that you're, that you're referencing in terms of um, substance abuse and housing and immigration and all the other complicated um, psychosocial issues that our clients are going to be facing you know, honestly, we don't have the capacity to do that in our clinic, but I think we will be able to develop um, a set of referrals and hopefully get people linked in in the community. Um, we have one social worker, and she, her full-time job is managing our HIV-infected Ryan White care clinic patients, and I, I don't think um, it's feasible for her to really be involved in, in the PrEP side. Any other comments? Uh, Dana, you look like you'd like to say something. Well, I just wanted to add, and, uh, and I'll be careful in saying this, and I hope I don't, uh, I don't offend anyone. I, I'm, 
I'm deeply concerned that I think we all know that the population that, or at least one of the populations that we m most hope to have benefit from PrEP is African American MSM, and particularly younger guys. And really uh, very sort of troubled by kind of the regular conversation I have with people about the deep suspicion, not just of PrEP, but of medical interventions um, kind of across the board, which we understand in its historical you know, context and and everything, but continues to really be a substantial barrier moving forward. And um, I, I, I think it's, you know, in, incumbent not only with sort of an increased emphasis on, you know, uh, trying to in, expand uh, testing and linkage to care and treatment with, uh, in among African American MSM, uh, but with regard to delivering prep, that we do everything that we can to begin to sort of persuade communities to, you know, sort of come into the tent, and that these interventions are uh, are well-meaning, that they can be highly effective um, in protecting individuals in the community, but I, I, I think it requires a, a fairly substantial investment if we really want to, um, you know, make sure that that population in particular be, uh, benefits from this. Thanks, Dana. Any other comments uh, any of the panel would like to address about the issue of demonstration projects? If not, Ume, you've uh, you've been off the hook for a bit, and uh, the next area uh, is one that you've really given a lot of uh, thought to, and this is the question about what are the likely effects as uh, prep rolls out um, in terms of resistance on a community level? Um, do we think that this is dependent on drug therapy? Uh, what's the possible relationship of resistance and adherence? We know we know some of the answers, but you could help walk us through uh, how we might start thinking about this uh, now that we're moving from. Uh, randomized control trials to implementation. Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. We have very exciting and encouraging data from our PrEP trials. However, these studies are not designed to address the population level and or long-term impact of PrEP. We do have some valuable insights from mathematical modeling studies. And I'm going to um, just mention some of these insights that we have so far. ART combined with PrEP is likely to have a bigger HIV prevention impact than either strategy alone. ART is predicted to contribute more, much more, to drug resistance than is PrEP. Inadvertent PrEP use by previously infected persons could increase drug resistance from PrEP, particularly those with established infection more so than those with acute infection in settings where we have generalized mature epidemics. Overlapping drugs for ART and PrEP could increase resistance prevalence, again, particularly in settings where treatment options are limited. The key influences on resistance prevalence from PrEP, that is excluding inadvertent PrEP use in those who are infected at baseline, include coverage, greater the coverage, greater the resistance, testing frequency, more frequent testing, less resistance, and efficacy of PrEP, higher the efficacy, less drug resistance. So what can we do to minimize drug resistance from PrEP? Uh, some of the strategies could include uh, efficient and prioritized coverage, accurate and frequent HIV testing. And finally, let's celebrate the success of our PrEP trials and also continue to work towards non-overlapping drugs for ART and PrEP. That's in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks. That's quite a nutshell. Thank you. Uh, uh, so would anyone else on the panel like to comment on what Ume said? Unpeel some of these uh, these issues. Um, do we think we have systems in place now to disentangle the contribution of um, uh, resist community-based resistance uh, uh, related to uh, treatment versus the uh, potential incremental uh, changes that we might see with PrEP? Or do people accept Ume's uh, suggestion that that is going to not be uh, uh, so significant and therefore um, may not be that easily uh, measured on in terms of surveillance. You know? I was going to say, again, I think we're perhaps fortunate, but um, because we have this um, 
single network of clinics, then we, we do have resistance surveillance as well. So we have, I think, 67,000 or something um, uh, you know, uh, the specimens in the resistance database for the UK. And I, I think really clinics are going to have to do through these national surveillance um, mechanisms where you've got them, that you try and tease out the relative contribution uh, that comes from the treated population versus the um, versus the, the HIV negative population who are using it for, um, uh, you know, for, for prevention. But I, I, there was a question here, wasn't there? Is resistance dependent on specific drug therapy? Well, of course it is. <laughs> and, and, and clearly choosing drugs with a high genetic barrier is really, is, is really key. Um, and I think that generally we felt very reassured by the data that came out of the DART um, study that was done in, in Uganda and Zimbabwe, but with no people were randomized to have, they, everyone had HIV. Um, uh, and 67%, I think, of individuals were on tenofovir, and people were randomized to have clinical monitoring only uh, when a clinician could request um, a routine safety lab, um, never resistance, um, uh, a clinical safety lab uh, if they needed it for clinical reasons, uh, or they were getting them as part of a, a routine uh, lab monitoring. Nobody got the result of the resistance test or the viral load during the course of the, of the study. Uh, and um, the, the, the patients have followed up for five years, and the prevalence of resistance at the end is exactly the same as it, as it, as it was at the end of one year follow-up, as, as five years follow-up, there's no difference. Uh, and the K65 uh, mutation never appeared in the participants who completed 12 structured treatment interruptions. So they were checked eight weeks after finishing their, you know, their, their antiretroviral regime, um, and uh, there was never K65 was never uh, was never detected. So I think we've been extremely reassured by those data um, that provided you've got a mechanism for um, surveillance. Uh, uh, you can you, you don't need to worry about resi resistance shouldn't stop you from uh, from prep um, uh, rollout. Thank you. So I just want to build on that and on something Ume said. I mean, I think that in thinking about another thing that demonstration projects really need to think about, how are we going to best detect incident infections that occur in people who are participating in these demonstration projects? And we haven't really talked about that. I think it's down the bottom of our list here. But if you think about strategies to do that, and maybe Stephanie could comment on what they're planning to do in the San Francisco Clinic. I mean, we've been talking about periodic antibody testing using standard tests, and I think that's obviously sort of one standard. I think thinking about pooling RNA uh, samples and thinking about what's cost-effective in terms of of looking at that as surveillance, do you do that with the people who are in the project and how do you actually affect that? Newer generation antibody tests, can they detect earlier infection and how are they, they going to be incorporated into these projects? And then what about giving people tests to take home with them? Uh, what about saliva tests and actually sort of having people initiate testing based on their symptoms or based on their risk perception? So I think just to be a little provocative and think about models that may um, give patients or participants, I should say, more determination about when they're tested, and also think about looking at strategies using newer testing approaches. Perhaps they're more expensive now. Perhaps they're not going to be relevant relevant to Durban, South Africa at the moment, but that's not to say that in five years we won't be able to do that. So I think we should be thinking broadly and creatively and aggressively about how we can really enhance detection of acute infection, of course, beyond the sort of syndromic um, identification that we discussed this morning that I think is really important. Um, so, Stephanie, maybe you want to mention, not that I'm taking over your moderation, plan, but I'm just going to ask Stephanie to comment on what they were planning to do in San Francisco. So we're sort of in the fortunate position of not having to make a decision about this because our standard of care currently at our clinic is that we do RNA pooling on all MSM who come in for a rapid um, HIV antibody test. So we will continue to offer that um, through our demonstration project. Now, that said, our sister site, Miami, who we're hoping will be able to join us in this, does not offer um, RNA pooling. Um, and so we'll be kind of working with them and able to look at some differences across the two sites um, in terms of the detection of acute HIV. I think the question of whether RNA pooling is cost-effective is an important one. And there was a paper in PLOS earlier this year, I think Peter Kurt was the lead author that was a modeling study looking at when RNA pooling makes sense, and it 
you know, depends on some factors that are probably intuitive, like the prevalence and incidence of HIV in the population being tested, as well as the frequency of testing within that population. Um, so I don't necessarily think RNA pooling makes sense across sites, but it is what we do. Um, clearly, in the resource-limited setting context, um, that's not going to be a possibility. But HIV testing diagnostics are um, such a rapidly moving field that I think there may be point-of-care HIV RNA tests in the near future that are um, affordable. And then we also have the fourth-generation antigen antibody test which is going to rapidly become standard of care and decreases the window um, to detection of HIV infection significantly, such that it's about you know, 14 to 21 days with a fourth generation antibody as opposed to um, maybe 10 to 14 with, with an RNA test. So I think this, this issue of um, identifying acute HIV in patients who are on PrEP is crucial, but I think the technology to do it is it's, is moving and rapidly changing. Um, and so how it's integrated into PrEP projects is also going to be um, by nature in flux. Um, so I think for settings that currently don't have a fourth generation test or the capacity to do RNA, frequent HIV antibody testing with really thorough screening for symptoms at every PrEP visit is going to be essential. Um, and um, as I think was mentioned earlier, there's other possible strategies like uh, staggered HIV antibody tests prior to the initiation of PrEP and things like that, although my personal feeling is that could increase the barrier to and, and create a missed opportunity for starting yeah. starting folks. Thanks, Stephanie. So, so the take-home is that testing adherence is also a, a, as important as we think about medication adherence. But let's move on to uh, two, two uh, related and, and very uh, uh, challenging areas for PrEP. Um, Danny, would you want to comment about the issues about resource allocation? Um, uh, we have wonderful data from HP10052 um, about the benefits to treating infected individuals at higher CD4 counts and the public health benefit. And then we have um, uh, PrEP and other chemoprophylactic approaches. How do we how do we put this all together in, in this current era of shrinking budgets? I don't know what did the stock market do today. <laughs> <laughs> you can't retire. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I knew that already. <laughs> well, um, you know, obviously a difficult and, and increasingly difficult uh, question. I think, you know, a year uh, or a year and a half ago when, you know, we were sort of looking at a brand new national HIV AIDS strategy that is sort of pointed in the right direction with regard to encouraging, uh, you know, more treatment of HIV-positive people and, uh, and biomedical prevention interventions, we, uh, we also thought we had in our back pocket the very tool that we need uh, to, you know, finance all of these things, which, which is the Affair Affordable Care Act. Um, it, I think it goes without saying that, you know, in order to, uh, it, particularly because the people that we are talking about expanding treatment to, and I think for, for the most part, the people that we are talking about uh, trying to make PrEP available to are uh, Medicaid um, patients, not Medicare patients for the, for the most part, uh, but Medicaid patients. Uh, the expansion of, of, uh, of insurance coverage is extremely important. And uh, so the, the, the fate of national health care reform is extremely important to PrEP. To prep. Um, I'll back up, though, to say that um, I think there is there has been great concern expressed among HIV positive people and others about the potential that uh, as we you know because we have uh, waiting lists for ADAP medications and there are other sort of resource limitations on our ability to provide care for HIV positive people that pre that prep uh, is essentially just uh, an, a an additional threat. Um, but I think it's extremely important, and I know that HIV-positive um, gay men and others are beginning to sort of stand up to say that, you know, we must uh, find a way as advocates to make sure that both of these things are paid for, that we do not pit uh, treatment, care and treatment, against the prevention needs of the epidemic. Project Inform is an agency that was not historically involved in HIV prevention. We've been, you know, advocates for... Um, you know, for drug discovery for HIV and for the care and financing of treatment and for patient education. Um, and it became increasingly clear that if we really want to meet 
our obligation to provide for the health care of HIV positive people, we have to turn off the spigot of new infections. Um, and th uh, at this point, uh, I think it's safe to say that, you know, obviously we hope for a vaccine, we hope for a microbicide, uh, but PrEP currently represents potentially our best opportunity to do that, and so we simply must uh, make this investment. Um, again, in terms of, you know, the actual mechanics of making uh, that happen, um, I think that uh, because we are essentially here to talk about, you know, uh, whether or not the FDA approves Truvada for use in prevention, uh, that decision is extremely important uh, to the ability to move forward to finance this intervention, both at a private level and at a public level, um, and and I think is an, a very important consideration uh, in all of this, as our uh, sort of continued existence of uh, CDC and public health service guidelines as to how uh, this can be used. Um, though the, those decisions will, will be extremely important to all of the systems that are making decisions about whether to cover this. Um, I believe that insurance companies are here to sort of talk about this later, but there, fortunately, there is, you know, good indication that there are a number of large providers, Kaiser and Aetna and others, who have stepped up to the plate even uh, though PrEP is an off-label use at this time. Uh, to um, agree to uh, pay for this intervention. Um, in many cases, they may not exactly know what a prescription is being written for, but even in cases where there is awareness um, that this is obviously, you know, a suboptimal uh, uh, treatment uh, for an HIV-positive person, it is being covered. And there may uh, certainly be cases in which under Medicaid programs throughout the country now, uh, people are actually able to access it. Um, but again, um, I think if we, you know, are to think about uh, the long-term financing of PrEP, the Medicaid system is extremely important. We must protect the Affordable Care Act in order to uh, assure that PrEP is paid for for the people for whom we most want to have benefit from it. That will essentially be, a, nevertheless, be a state-by-state, -state, uh, you know, battle. Um, I could predict that there will be states... Um, where uh, it is relatively easy to secure coverage for this intervention and, and uh, states in which it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Um, in sort of the interim, um, you know, with regard to implementation, many states are seeking uh, 1115 waivers that make it possible to expand uh, health care coverage, if not to sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, as in California, where we have an 1115 waiver that sort of uh, sets the stage for implementation of national health care reform, uh, which allows, you know, an additional 600,000 Californians to secure coverage. Um, there are efforts in a number of states to try to secure uh, uh, HIV-specific 1115 waivers. And while those have, uh, for the most part, been thought of as a mechanism to finance care and treatment for HIV-positive people, I think it's important for us to think of them as a potential means by which we would cover um, uh, people who are high risk but HIV-negative as well and to make sure that those are as comprehensive uh, as possible. Um, when push comes to shove, um, I think it may be necessary uh, but difficult in this current economic environment, obviously, for advocates uh, to be prepared to ask for a, a particular and, and line item specific appropriation that makes it possible for us to fully provide for PrEP, both in terms of the delivery and the cost of medications. Um, but needless to say, that will be extremely difficult. Uh, yeah, Mitchell, please. And and Mitchell, Mitchell, before you start, um, another issue, I, which I think is a follow-on, which I was going to ask you to address, is the whole issue of how do we reach the most vulnerable people? Because, again, we, we don't you know, if PrEP is going to benefit uh, people, uh, it shouldn't just be uh, people who are affluent, uh, who are from one specific uh, race or ethnic group. Uh, given the demographics of the e epidemic, we've heard this theme loud and clear today that trying to reach uh, people in the black community, particularly the young MSM of color, is going to be really important. Well, that's great, because one of the things I, I was going to say might, might lead into the, the second answer, and that is that, that I hope that, that henceforth and forevermore we can abolish um, statements like, you know, PrEP versus treatment uh, as a resource allocation. Um, it's a question of the resource allocation between effective evidence-based interventions and 
non-effective or ineffective or less effective and non-evidence-based interventions. We fund many things with many dollars from many different line items, public and private, that are not evidence-based and are not particularly efficient. So we need to transition into evidence-based efficient programs, and that's both prevention and treatment. And, and obviously, I do believe that, that the evidence tells us that PrEP, uh, as demonstrated in a number of clinical trials, has evidence to support it. We now need to expand on that to show how to efficiently deliver it. And we don't yet have those answers, hence the demonstration projects. But uh, in, in my mind, it's not PrEP versus treatment. It's about effectiveness and efficiency versus ineffectiveness and inefficiency, of which there are many. And that means when one really plays that out, we should stop funding some things. And I think we talked about this a lot internationally at the International AIDS Conference recently. It's easy to say all the things we should be doing more of, scaling up testing, scaling up male circumcision, scaling up uh, treatment or prevention, scaling up PrEP. We need to start talking about what to scale down or eliminate because there are inefficiencies in the system. So that lecture aside, how do we reach the most vulnerable and the most important who can benefit the best from PrEP? Um, it's kind of awkward to be getting that question, I guess, in some ways. Um, I, 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 I'm, I live in New York, and I think about Dr. Sweeney's comment about the most at risk, young black MSM between 13 and 29. Um, it may not be that obvious to all of you, but I am not that young. Um, I am not black, and I, I don't happen to be an MSM. Um, I'm grateful to be on this panel. Um, let's, ask, let's ask the people for whom we think PrEP might be useful how we can reach them, how to engage them. And again, it's back to the simple basics of, of marketing 101. Know your audience. Um, I have some opinions on how we do that, um, but we need to engage the communities that can best benefit from PrEP. And I'm not trying to be rhetorical here. I, in practice, there are ways to reach those audiences with testing, with condoms, with PrEP. And we need to engage with that audience. We need to engage with the providers uh, who are already delivering all sorts of things to those communities. And we need to understand how best to integrate PrEP within those structures. And again, that doesn't mean that every group that's out there talking to young black MSM should be delivering pills, but they should be able to deliver the information generated by good clinical trials that can help people get access when they want it, when they need it, when they can get it. And then finally, I just want to say that we have a big challenge ahead of us, I think, with respect to PrEP and with respect to many other interventions. And, and it's the key questions that come up. Um, who gets it, who wants it, and who needs it? And the answers to those three questions are often not the same. And more often than not, they're different. Um, and we need to be sure that we understand from a public health perspective who needs it, and hopefully figure out ways to be sure that they want it, if they want it, making that choice, and that if they do want it, that they get it. Um, very often, our system works the opposite way. Um, I want it, I'll get it, even if I don't need it. So we need to be sure that we are building programs that are addressing the needs, the wants, um, and our abilities to deliver them. Yeah, see that. Can I think that um, it all brings us back to this issue of partnership if we want to do more for less. And I was wondering whether in the U.S. setting there are kind of any specific barriers to these partnerships between community-based organizations who can reach and, and, and obtain the user perspective and how the user wants the, uh, to, to access PrEP, and the sort of clinic-based organizations where at the moment the prescribing power lies. I, I don't, I, I don't, it's a bit of an issue for us in the UK, but it's not a big one. You know, we, we have a PrEP working group that's an email group, which is full of community-based organizations and clinicians, and we can have very instant communication, and we can identify where there are gaps where a community-based organization could actually provide that behavioral intervention in the clinic, could, you know, set up the adherence club to help people with their PrEP or their treatment, maybe the disclosure club. Disclosure is a very big issue here, as I've mentioned, I know before. I, I just, are there particular barriers in the U.S. that stop these partnerships being because we do have to do more for less in, in the first instance. But if we don't pay for PrEP today, we'll only be paying for treatment tomorrow. Well, yeah. So, so, so she, Sheena actually addressed a question to the audience. And we, our wonderful panel, we've been going on for a while. And it would be great to have uh, people's questions or comments from the audience. We have a few uh, also submitted. Yeah, please. Thanks, Robert Reinhardt. So, um, 
this is a great panel, and it makes me think of some of the FDA issues we've he heard about. So when we say, how do we identify who needs it or how to target, in FDA speak, that becomes, so how do you define the indication for uh, any of the groups we've been talking about? And we've sort of skirted over the idea that MSM and heterosexuals are not uniformly <laughs> identical in framing that important label difference. And the other thing that's important about this panel is that it shows how much pent-up creativity and energy there is to start answering so many questions. We can, we're not going to answer them all the same or in one big fabulous demonstration project. So that suggests that we don't really want to hold up where we started in the morning, that CDC slide of where the epidemic is. So while I personally wish we had an indication for MSM and heterosexuals all tomorrow, um, we don't want to delay uh, having an indication for MSM if the data are sufficient and of better quality to do that while we answer some of the questions like, why did FEMPEP not work or something like that? Because we have projects ready to go to follow the epidemic and the FDA process can help facilitate these. Thanks. Anybody on the panel like to respond? Oh, agreed. Uh, agreed. Please. Um, I guess my comment was going back to what are the barriers to some of those relationships, and it brings me back to the role of stigma um, in this conversation and that we're not implementing any of these things outside of the political context that people are living in, and um, especially when we look at sort of the geographic shift of the epidemic over the last decade into parts of the rural south, where, you know, we have states in the South that give no state funds uh, to HIV AIDS programming. That certainly is a barrier. Um, one of the most vulnerable and affected populations we see are persons who have been incarcerated, and that presents another barrier with uh, accessing that population. Um, and finally, you know, where do we go uh, with women? Um, how, how do we access women? What are our next steps after Fem prep, and um, I work on. I'm uh, my name's Lauren. I work with HHS, and one of the issues I work on is uh, elimination of perinatal transmission. Um, but how do we gain access to women before they're pregnant, um, and for women who have no intention of getting pregnant? So I put those out there as well. Jeannie. Quick response. I want to thank you for bringing that up, to prompting me to, to say this. I do think that this issue of stigma and stigma as it relates to the ability to be adherent with PrEP are really critical for demonstration projects to think about, particularly for women. I just wanted to share with people that in the voice study where we've now enrolled over 5,000 women in sub-Saharan Africa, we haven't had a lot of women terminate from the study, but the majority of women have terminated from the study because of social harms from participating in the study. It's not just their boyfriends who think that they are in the study because they're at risk of HIV or they covertly have HIV or they're going to get HIV from being in the study. It's not just their boyfriends. It's their mothers sometimes. It's their girlfriends. It's their community members. So particularly for women, I think, where there's an incredible power differential and hierarchy in those relationships, not to say that doesn't occur in same-sex partnerships too occasionally, particularly around age discord in couples, I think that's a really important outcome to start thinking about as we fold them into these demonstration projects, especially for especially for vulnerable minority populations. Again, it's not just a sex-specific um, hierarchical problem. So thanks a lot. Um, I just have a question about demonstration projects, and I wonder if there is any finding from a demonstration project, whether planned, um, objective, or not, that would make you reconsider an indication or recommending prep. So I'm, I'm thinking, as an example, maybe profound increase in STIs over over historical norms. One character to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, if, if we don't see a net benefit, then how can we justify um, paying for it? If we don't see a net cost-effective benefit, and, and so perhaps I should have explained that it, it would, it, although the, the primary outcome is HIV, but it's going to have a full economic analysis, which will include the cost of um, of, 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 uh, of STIs, and I think our particular concern there would be hepatitis C, which we're seeing in increasing numbers is quite a difficult condition to manage and can come back recurrently. So, so I think that, that if we don't see a net benefit in terms of uh, 
you know, the cost savings per infection inverted. Um, I think yours was a randomized controlled trial, right? And I and I think probably that's a unique situation, maybe to to uh, it could be conducted in Europe or UK. But in the United States, we're talking about demonstration projects, and I imagine they will be descriptive in some way. And so I'm just wondering if there's any of these kind of we keep on talking about demonstration. I imagine they're descriptive. Is, is that ever going to yield any information that's going to make us say, oh, should we have not recommended PrEP? And are you, would you design, can you design a demonstration project, which I don't think will be randomized, that would that would make you pause on what you've just done? Uh, James. I would say that it should be an adaptive design, sort of stealing from the vaccine field kind of thing. So basically, if you see an increase in SDI incidents in some of these projects, it's telling you that you need to modify that intervention and focus more on some of those components that perhaps you weren't able to do it. So I think this is all so new that we're really going to be in a big, steep learning curve at these, as these things get underway. And it may make you say, okay, we should reconsider how we did this. Does it still mean that the biological efficacy of PrEP is not as good as what we thought it was when we decided to initiate these? No. So it really, I think, goes back to what Mitchell said about how do we make these packages comprehensive and efficient and effective um, looking at all of these outcomes. I think your question's a great one, but it's really something we're going to have to monitor as we go along. The, the line yeah. to see so much interest, but so I'm going to ask every questioner to be succinct and response to be succinct, please. Hi, hi, thank you. Martha Brady from the Population Council. We actually do a lot of implementation science research around a whole range of reproductive health topics in developing countries. And to add on to your point here, I mean, I think in demonstration projects or operations research, I mean, one of the things you want to look at sort of patterns of use and use dynamics of whatever the product is, I think is actually critical. And understanding the implications of imperfect use of a product, those are things you need to be doing now in demonstration projects, looking at what service model or models or program package or packages are most effective and under what conditions. And then you have to lay out what are those conditions that actually make that effective. I do think it's really a, an absolute critical time. This comes from many years of doing implementation research on a whole range of topics. But one of the things that we actually feel is really important to put in some of these demonstration projects is this look at social determinants. And so social determinants to both risk behavior, social determinants, a whole range of things around the social determinants, I think, is key at, at this point in an implementation stage. And one other thing I would just like to suggest here, I think to the last point, I mean, you will find out stuff that maybe you didn't, you hoped you didn't, or you didn't find in the clinical trials. That's why you do this. So then the question, you don't necessarily find the efficacy of the product has diminished, but you do find you need to alter design. Public health effectiveness is a different reality. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to make sure that we don't let the, the perfect become the enemy of the possible here. And, and, you know, the truth is, is that it particularly as it results to adherence or risk compensation, they're messy and they're complex and they're really hard to measure. And, you know, one of the things that, that I think is going to be important as we approach these demonstration projects is to start with the context of where we're planning to deliver it and not with what's easy to measure and, and how to, how it's easy to measure it. Because, you know, when we talk about particularly certain very challenged communities, you know, with a lot of, of, of obstacles in front of them, um, we need to look at what is uh, realistic in terms of adherence and, and uptake and all of that kind of stuff. So, Hi, Erica Aaron from uh, Drexel College of Medicine in Philadelphia. I just, well, I'm a clinician and um, I was involved in um, the 076 trial when it was unva un unveiled and getting a public health effort out immediately to ensure that um, you know, we, 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 we did away with perinatal transmission. We didn't wait for any trials at that point. The trial was on, you know, was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, revealed and we started immediately doing a public health effort. And since then we've done, there have been trials and we've found, you know, we, we have learned from that. And I think we should use that example here as well. The demonstration projects, the randomized trials are going to be very helpful to the future, but if we wait as, um, was just noted, then we, you know, the, the infections are going to accumulate. And my patients are already taking Truvada. They're coming to me, the, especially women who are um, interested in conception. They're all, they're coming to me on Truvada because they're taking their um, partner's Truvada. So it's there are part our patients are telling us, and they're they're leading the way. Um, and I think we need to follow that. And, and additionally, the question about um, women, 
I think family planning, as um, Cornelius mentioned, I think family planning programs, Title X programs, are perfectly set up and have been have a long history of doing HIV testing um, and are starting to do some HIV care in their clinics. And I think family planning projects is a great place to do uh, to start to look at prep with women. Yeah, my own Tanlu AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Now, I want to just put a cautionary note that, um, you know, despite the mesmerizing results and uh, scientific discussion, um, PEP for money is not increasing. And there are 15 million people that they are they're requiring antiretroviral. There are many people in our country that they are waiting for antiretroviral. And when you said that, uh, Sheena, that uh, if you don't put uh, PrEP right now, you have to treat it, given the result of 96% efficacy, uh, it is better to treat them, isn't it better to treat them right now with the money, short money that we have, than rather than invest on some other industry? Well, it's best to do both, more for less. <laughs> Charles. Yeah. Don and then Charles. Um, yeah, I actually want to go back to something that Susan asked earlier about the barriers to sort of achieving that perfect mix between the access to the pill and the access to the sort of critical support of wraparounds. And in many ways, I think in the United States, many, and I'm the state aids director for Massachusetts, it has to do with how we receive federal funding from the CDC and for HRSA for services for people living with HIV and for services for people who are not but may be at risk. And increasingly, we're seeing this extraordinary blending as HRSA is moving us towards positive prevention work and as CDC is moving us towards early intervention work. But yet, at, on the ground, there's still these silos that exist, and it makes it very hard to leverage the care resources on the HRSA side and the prevention resources on the CDC side. So that's one piece. The other thing is Mitchell's comment about sort of we need to scale back on some things that we've been doing. I think CDC is really helping us start to vision that in sort of calling on us to, to only invest in the highest impact interventions, and I want to sort of support that direction. And I think we need help figuring out what really is the highest impact interventions to invest in. Some of the modeling work David Holdgrave has done around sort of helping us make those decisions are really critical. So structural interventions at the governmental level is what I'm hearing. Charles. Yes. Uh, just to, you know, in terms of investments, we think these um, most all the demonstration projects will be built on existing infrastructure, okay, or at least the ones that have been discussed so far, which is Wall Street speak, and Wall Street's not doing terribly well. So I'll ask the sort of something that is doing well, sort of the Walmart model here. Um, in San Francisco, as in the UK, um, how many people do you think you'll be uh, seeing in the first year, and how much do you expect to be spending in San Francisco and in the UK? Because uh, I'd like to know in terms of numbers, because I want to know how many demonstration projects do we need? How many different places do we have to place demonstration projects? I'd like sort of help on that. So our plan is to enroll 300 participants um, in the first year. And again, that's going to depend on referrals from outside agencies, not just on our clinic patients. The cost is difficult because the cost, a lot of the cost, honestly, is building the personnel and infrastructure to be able to monitor and evaluate the program and do the research necessary to um, look at the outcomes of the project. So our budget is about $900,000 for this um, first year. But again, I don't think that reflects the cost of um, administering PrEP in our clinic. Um, a lot of that is the cost of doing the the, uh, the research itself. Um, Dana? I can tell you quite precisely. <laughs> uh, yes, I've got a spreadsheet. I'm going to say, I think it's 5.6 million pounds uh, for the clinic cost for 5,000 participants to take part over two years. So that is two years of drug for two and a half thousand. And um, uh, no, no drug, no drug costs here. The actual clinic costs, but you, and then the monitoring is the same actually, whether you get the drug straight away or you get it after 12 months. 5.6 million pounds for 5,000 people. Yeah, Mitchell, please. And I also was not including drug costs for our project, which are yeah. being donated by Gilead. And, uh, actually, Mitchell, I want you to respond, but I also want Stephanie and Sheena and the rest of the panel to think about it, a quest, uh, one of the questions that was sent here. Um, asking about how real world are some of these demonstration projects that people are not having to pay for the medication. But Mitchell, you first. I, I, and I think that, that that's a great, great question. I think fundamentally we need to ensure that we don't end up with a bunch of random acts of goodness. Um, I, I tell you, I, well, I would hate, the worst case would be to do nothing based on the prep results. And that would be the absolute travesty if we sit here with all of the great clinical data and we do nothing. 
But not so much better than that is to have a bunch of demonstration projects, poorly funded, poorly coordinated, and not asking the right questions in a concerted effort to move the field forward. So what's the best case? The best case is to ensure that we do with urgency a coordinated strategy that says not just what are we going to learn in the UK and San Francisco, but what do we need to know to deliver prep, to optimize, to get to 42 or 44 or 63 or 72 percent. What do we need to do with a number of different populations? Because I also don't want to just know about this with a bunch of men in San Francisco and Boston, with all due respect to my dear friends in San Francisco and Boston. So where's Miami? Where's Atlanta? Where's the Deep South? Let's map this out. Let's let's be smart about it. Let's fund it. Let's obviously first cost it out and then fund it. And is it going to be free? No. Is it going to be a good investment? It will be if we do it the right way. And, and I really want to encourage us, uh, back to one of David's points, of not letting the, the perfect be the enemy of the possible or the good. Um, there is a ton we do not know about prep. And if we use that as an excuse not to do it, then we've really wasted a number of years and thousands of people's involvement as clinical trial participants. Um, so let's, let's not let this be the reason not to do it. Let's figure out how to do it well and quickly and efficiently. And I, I think it is going to cost you know, probably more pounds and more dollars than we currently have. But I think if we do it, we will figure out um, how to actually prevent infection. Jamie. Quickly, I, I think Mitchell's very, as always, eloquent about that sort of thing. But I think really the goal is to have something that's replicable, but also to balance that with enough creative and visionary tweaks so that you can actually maybe push the envelope a little bit with some of these so that you aren't sort of always chasing some vision of what we could do. So yes, we want a solid, replicable sort of core set of activities that we can evaluate in these demonstration projects that then maybe can be, adapt hopefully can be implemented wherever in this core set and adapt it ideally, but then don't forget that there are creative things that we can do, and we should sort of unleash that to really try to see if we can enhance um, our ability to find out how to deliver this. Uh, our last major question, Dr. Yancey. The national surveillance systems that we're well aware the UK has, can you briefly speak to any standards, guidelines, best practices? within the clinical setting that have gotten those uh, lab results, lack of resistance that you shared with us? Education for prescribers. So, I had, had, so, so we have two professional associations, but the British HIV Association has a series of guidelines, and our Health Protection Agency, which is the equivalent of CDC, contributes to many of those guidelines, and they're available on the website. And they go through a, a you know consultation, uh, and and then they they become guidance. And then we audit, we do national audit to make sure people are adhering to the guidelines. So, uh, were you specifically asking about resistance? Yeah, 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 exactly. So the, there's also then the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV, and they're dealing more with, with those guidance, um, you know, for, for, for how you're managing people, the, the sort of uh, triage, if you like, for high-risk individuals who would go off and see, you know, get additional counselling, be offered uh, motivation interviewing. So over the last two or three years, we've been scaling up uh, well, examining our approach to HIV testing and introducing behavioral interventions in clinic and in community-based organizations and, you know, doing testing in A&E and all sorts of things like that. And I, we, a wealth of data have come, you know, from those demonstration projects, as we would call them, that then inform the guidelines. So the guidelines are constantly on the move and evolving on the basis of data that come back from research projects. Uh, and I think that uh, a really clear message that came from our community-based organizations as well indeed from the clinics is just this difficulty of engaging the HIV-negative population and the opportunity that PrEP offers to really uh, bring people in and perhaps uh, uh, an even better opportunity then to do a, a cell on the, on the motivational interviewing. And I, I can't think of a better 
way for an individual to calculate that trade-off between taking a tablet every day, which is what you would do if you had HIV eventually, um, or even hopefully immediately, um, uh, versus, you know, actually, could I make sure that I'm having sex with somebody who's positive and got undetectable virus or, you know, negative, and I really know they're negative. You know, I think there's, it'll be a trade-off, and I do think it's going to kickstart behavioral interventions in a way that has been a struggle, actually, to do so up to this point in time. Thanks, Sheena. Um, you know, we've really covered quite quite a terrain uh, in, uh, in a fairly short period of time. So, so, so if, if some of you are feeling that we're reeling a little bit, uh, uh, I, I certainly feel that. There's an awful lot. There, there's, there's an awful... There's, yeah, no, it, it, they're all important issues. I mean, I think the themes are coordination. We got, we have some of these first generation demonstration projects that are just getting underway. We're, uh, it's our own peril if, if there's not more cross talk, uh, between, uh, the different programs so that we can keep learning because this is going to be an iterative process, uh, um, you know, to get it right. Um, there, there are these specters, um, uh, such as a specter of resistance, but that, that actually, it, it can, then goes back to, um, really understanding PrEP as a package and not a pill, um, so that, uh, part, part of the mitigation of resistance is going to be increasing adherence. Part of, uh, the mitigation of resistance is going to be increasing, um, uh, testing and engagement, uh, in, in care. Uh, creativity is going to have to be the watchword, um, financial creativity. And, um, I, I, I wasn't facetious when I said structural, intervention at the governmental level because there has been on state levels and certainly at the federal level the tendency to think of prevention and treatment as, as very separate and i think uh, this past year has really said that we have uh, you know that the fields have to talk to each other learn from each other and try to um, use the, the limited resources in the most um, e efficient way um, and another theme that I, I i think we all have to really take to heart is how to engage uh, the people who can benefit most and clearly there are um, community uh, stakeholders uh, some of whom are here today, but many of whom are not, that we have to continue to um, talk to and learn from if we're going to really be able to make PrEP accessible to those who will benefit the most. So I really want to thank the panel for their uh, active participation and for all of you. Uh,